Hi, everyone. I'm Salma Qureshi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the University of Texas at San Antonio's Neuroscience Research Podcast. So welcome to 2021. It's January 28th, and today we're talking with our own Francesco Savelli, who is an assistant professor here at UTSA. Hi, Francesco. Hi. Um, Francesco started life in computer science and robotics engineering before finding his way into experimental neuroscience. He's um, started his lab here a year ago to continue a body of work that toggles between um, computational modeling and experimental hypothesis testing to define how place and grid cells establish spatial codes that underlie navigation, how they're generated, and how they fit into a larger relational hippocampal network that serves cognitive ab abstractions outside the spatial domain. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a life's work right there. You'll be busy <laughs> for a while with that. So um, today we're joined by um, fellow place cell and spatial navigation specialist, Isabel Muzio. Hi, Isabel. Hello. And of course, Charlie, Charlie Wilson. Hello. Oh. Hi, Charlie. Um, so I, was, I want to start with a pair of really irresponsibly extracted quotes, which I won't attribute, um, and I don't really believe are as diametrically op opposed as I'm perhaps suggesting, but I, I want to use them to kind of pose a basic conceptual question to you, Francesco, about where to begin with place and grid cells and the problem of navigation. So namely, is, is the goal to use computations to build representations that live in the hippocampal network, the hippocampal and enterrhinal network, or do we understand this network as a, as a machine that implements computations on representations, representations that kind of percolate through it? Um, so I actually feel like I don't even really need to read the quotes at this point, <laughs> but, but uh, I think I, I, I will. Um, so let's see, where is the quote? Um, so one may consider the hippocampus as a general purpose sequence generator that encodes content limited ordinal structure and tiles the gaps between events or places <laughs> which may be viewed as a global function. The hippocampus may be blind regarding the modality and nature of the inputs. It, it processes the sent messages the same way, irrespective of their origin and returns its judgment to the source. Um, so the answer to what is the function of, of the hippocampus may be different depending on the routes the investigator tests in her experiments. It could be space, time, sound, frequency, odor, sound, sequence, memory, so, or something else. So then the other quote, which is sort of the, uh, sort of opposing um, uh, point of view is, so that rather than suggesting that hippocampus has a single global function, I think we should think of it as performing multiple computations on a specific representation. Um, that representation is well described as an encoding of the relationship between sensory, uh, external sensory objects and an internal coordinate system. So in other words, a cognitive map. So I think embedded in this question also is this idea that like when we talk about maps, are maps representations or computations? <laughs> so anyway, I hope there's some, there's some meat in there, hopefully. Go ahead, Francesco. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> well, there is, yeah, there is a lot of points there and questions there <laughs> to answer <laughs> and a lot of uh, work to do to clarify concepts and, um, Probably anybody you ask, they will clarify concept in a different way, of course. Um, you know, in terms of the big, big uh, question about computations and representations, that's interesting because that was something that was really on my mind as a computer scientist when I switched to neuroscience. I came from a, a school of thought of AI, which was fundamentally, it was not too interested in how the brain works. The idea there was always, um, you know, humans have learned how to fly when they stopped imitating birds. And so for artificial intelligence, uh, you know, same thing, why, you know, it doesn't matter how the brain does it or, uh, you know, um, asking if a machine can think is like, asking if uh, submarines can swim and things like that. So those were the quotes back then days. And I grew up in that school and I learned a lot from that school. And then when I was visiting uh, Ben Kivers um, at UT who is also an AI researcher, but really coming from the cognitive science standpoint, um, I really learned to appreciate the approach that takes into account you know, at least getting interested in how the mind might work and ideas from psychology, neuroscience, 
I know often cognitive science and neuroscience are kind of pitted against each other. I don't believe that that should be the case. But one tenet of cognitive science is that you have these representations and computational processes that are somehow distinct. And as a computer scientist, I always question whether you should really keep them distinct. Because if you really study theoretical computer science, there's no reason why data and algorithms should be distinct. There is something called you know, the lambda calculus on which a lot of theoretical computer science is based in which data and algorithms are basically embedded in the same language. And the way that a computational process works is more like a chemistry. Um, and I thought, you know, if you're thinking about the brain, are really representation and computation separated? Because, you know, you look at the brain, you have neurons that fire, okay? Okay, neurons fire. Now you look at a neuron that fires, is that a neural correlate? Is it about representation? But there's also computations in a way, and those probably are mediated by neurons that fire. So we also have this, um, in a way, a bias as experimenter, we stick electrodes in the brain, we have the animal do something, and then we, the best we can do is just correlate the activity of that neuron with something the animal is doing, and then um, quantify correlates, and then from there start talking about representations. So that's really um, you know, an important point, I think, is the brain, is there really a separation between representation and computations in the brain? And I suspect there isn't. So that's kind of something I was trying to, um, I wanted to emphasize in my talk today, you know, when you look at the placer or a grid cell, is it just about two different spatial codes? Or is it just that you have two spatial codes because the, that particular part of the brain is trying to process information one stage farther, acquire new properties that are useful for some reason, you know, ethological, behavioral, cognitive, I don't know. And uh, in so doing, uh, the, the, the byproduct is that you see a neuron firing as a place cell or a neuron firing as a grid cell. And um, I mean, in terms of the other thing he says about like the hippocampus, but well, we should talk about what is a representation because you, you brought that up um, and people use that word. And uh, I don't think we always think carefully about what we really mean. Usually when I talk about the representation, either neural or cognitive, what I mean is, um, Something like what psychologists used to uh, use that word for, I think really like going back in the 19th century. So the idea that you have an image in the mind that um, is formed by presenting a stimulus, but that image can come back even in absence of the stimulus that first determined it. So that's the re-presentation. And so that's, that's kind of the idea. And I do believe if you just look at it that way, um, you can say the place cells are a representation because a lot of those properties that have been investigated early on, I was uh, saying in the talk by, you know, O'Keefe under two called the investigation of this property and proving that a place field is not a receptive field. It's not something that is there only when the stimulus, the landmark, the visual information, spatial information, whatever it is that it makes a fire there and can control it because it does control. You know, if you rotate the landmarks, all the place field rotate. So it seems like, okay, that's sensory, right? It looks like a receptive field. But then, you know, if you turn off the light, the place cells will still keep, they're able to sustain their rep representation, you know, in that sense. So I think there is an argument to be said that, you know, you can use that word. To the extent that that's um, in conflict with, say, the idea of an hippocampus as a building sequences or being this machinery that builds sequences, which is, um, I think, you know, what Zaghi was um, referring to. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that the hippocampus can build sequences. I mean, there's just so much data, and that's like kind of 
uh, there is no doubt. But now the, the interesting question is that what is the common ground between those sequences and, okay, the cognitive map as a cognitive representation. It seems like it's in conflict, but I don't think it is because, I mean, maybe Pogampos build sequences, but for some reason, when you put the animal um, you know, in, in two-dimensional space, you can appreciate this in two-dimensional space for some reason, these sequences organize themselves in a way to obey the uh, path equivalence property. So no matter what trajectory the animal takes, when it goes back, the cell, the place cell will fire again, right? So if you have a place field, the place cell fire in a spot, well, the animal can take any trajectory, goes back, the cell fires again. So that is, um, I mean, at least that's true at the level of firing rate, at the level of sequences, for example, with phase precession, I don't know that we have really been able to understand what phase precession is in 2D. There are interesting studies, but so the jury's still out there, I think. But uh, Francesco, I mean, you, you've done a lot of work. You've done a lot of work on path integration, and why do we need place cells? Aren't grid cells enough to kind of work out some of the early stage? So, I mean, can you say something about that? Why, why yeah. do we need place cells for that for for path integration? For example? Well, let's just say, for example, um, not everybody will agree, but let's just say that grid cells are somehow involved in path integration, or path integration is one of the processes that gives rise to the grid structure, or even that the grid structure is what it's in the eye of the beholder, the, the experimenter seeing that structure as a byproduct of those path integration computations. Um, well, uh, now we, you know, we don't, I don't know. It's still kind of an open question, not resolved, you know, exactly what the brain uses grid cells for. As a matter of fact, for grid cells, we really don't know what they, you know, much, even, even less than place cells. And I would say the question is still um, very much open, even for place cells. So to answer that question, you would need to answer the other question, but if you um, have these place cells, as I said in my talk, place cells have different properties than grid cells. So grid cells are fire in any environment. They immediately express these uh, spatial patterns. Place cells are more, um, you know, they're more capricious in many ways. They, they might not fire right away. They remap, they drift, they remap across context. There is this orthogonal representation in the sense that the code, and, you know, looking at what one place cell does, it doesn't really tell you all, all the time what other place cells do. So there seems to be a certain independence there. So maybe those properties are the result of this additional stage going from grid cells to place cells. And maybe the hippocampus make place cells not because you know, to make us happy, to show us another spatial code. It's just making places that's a byproduct of trying to add those properties to the spatial code, which might be useful for the other function the program possesses, like memory function. I was going to say something about that because when you were commenting about uh, whether it's processing sequences or uh, you were mentioning examples about the space, but I was thinking that that would be really in, important for episodic memories, right? Because you need the contextual information and you need to encode sequences of events that happen in different spatial contexts. And I think that uh, there are differences in points of view and we still don't completely understand what these cells do, but I think that the grid cells provide like a Cartesian map. They provide a lot of information about the location where an animal is relative to targets because you know, they have direction in some cases, they have the center of the grid, the angular information that, that the different points of the grid form with the center and so on, the spacing of the grid. But the place cells are known to incorporate other aspects of the environment, reward value, the motivational state of the animal, um, 
so many other cues that are integrated at the time that the cells fire. And I wanted to ask you something because you were talking today about the model and your model was trying to explain this property of, of the place cells, the remapping that we really still don't completely understand because it's, it's really um, very, very interesting. And I wanted to ask you this because it's, it was in the back of my head when you were talking and uh, in your model, one of the most interesting things that you mentioned, at least to me, was that the path of the animal determines in many ways, because your model uses this plasticity, uh, where the cell is going to fire, right? Depending on where the animal starts to navigate, the firing of the place field will change. The, the location-specific firing will change. Now, I want to know how that integrates with new findings, because the more we know about the hippocampus, even though there are hundreds and hundreds of studies, the more we discover new things that make the story more complex, right? So it seems now that some cells tend to remap more than others, because the work of McHugh has shown that some cells are totally unstable, and from trial to trial, they can fire in different locations and they express early genes such as CFOS, but other cells tend to be more stable, have a different genetic marker, and they seem to be more stable over time. So how does your model, and does your model only predict the activity of cells that are more unstable because they are dependent on where this, the animal starts navigating in a particular context? and that will determine the location-specific firing. Would you predict something different for cells that always fire in the same location, regardless of where the animal starts? I wanted to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, so um, two things. One, kind of as a caveat of sorts, also uh, linking back to the first thing you said, which answers probably uh, Salma's question better than I did which was, uh, well, place cells encode many other things other than space. My answer was more like, okay, what is the difference in terms of properties about space? But obviously place cells, the way that they're, that they're positioned anatomically to also receive inputs, for example, from the lateral and toronic cortex. So they're very well posed to uh, merge together spatial information that might come from grid cells and well, obviously comes from grid cells, but also potentially other kinds of cells. And then, any other thing, you know, it just goes back to this idea of the cognitive map of um, O'Keefe and Nadell, you know, just saying this is a spatial framework that then can be annotated, you know, with the items and experience of the organism. So in that sense, it's already like in a way contains an answer to your question because my model only looks at, okay, how the cell can get the spatial specificity from grid inputs, but then there are all these other inputs. And so based on what that cell receives, then you might see something that looks like spatial remapping, but it might be encoding something else. So that's like kind of the general question. In terms of a more technical question specific to my model, just kind of using um, speculatively like kind of Occam's razor to the maximum extent in which basically you say, okay, can you see that in, 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 in the model I presented? Well, one thing that I showed is that uh, it seems like the more unstable cells should be more septal and especially in larger environment. That because they receive these higher resolution grid cells. And because the way of the model works is that uh, it selects a subset of inputs that are have the same phase, but there could be a lot of combinatorial possibilities among those inputs, the random inputs to the cell so that you can have multiple competing sets of inputs that take over with each other. And so that's why there is that instant potential ability to create that drift. And so now the question is, uh, what you're referring to is, okay, you can see like cells that do more stable, less stable, even at say at the same septal temporal location, which supposedly they kind of receive the same range of grid resolution. Um, and, and that's 
that's to be discussed though, because if you look at how the topographical organization of the projections are, especially after the Mosers have discovered the modular organization of the grid, just the fact that the scale doesn't grow continuously along the septotemporal axis of the hippocampus, but it has these jumps, right? There are, there are these jumps. But the jumps are not, um, so there is a significant overlap anatomically in, in this. So I would say even potentially cells that are at the same, uh, in the hippocampus, that are at the same location along the acid septal tempora might by chance receive inputs of different scale, um, even a range, you know, of grid inputs of the different scale. I mean, in my own experience, it's like if you put a tethered in, in medial and terrena cortex, sometimes you record grid cells that have two, even three different uh, levels of scale on the same tethered. So, you know, projecting that to the hippocampus might explain why some cells and other cells. And the other thing that could explain that is the fact that by chance, a cell might get a subset, might get some inputs that have uh, less inherent uh, potential for competition between different subsets of inputs. And another might have instead um, um, inputs in which there are a lot of subsets of inputs that could compete because of the way they overlap. Um, so those are kind of three answers to your question. And now touching on that, because we are talking about different cells from the same area that can receive different inputs, but you touched on your talk today about something that I am really interested in. And, and then um, we, you didn't continue talking about it, but there is a phenomenon in the place I feel called over dispersion. And it means, I mean, for those that are listening to us, it means that even within a single trial, each time that the animal passes through the location where a particular cell fires, the firing rate is not completely homogeneous. In one pass, the cell may fire one action potential. In another pass, may fire four or five action potentials. So there is substantial variability. And that variability is what is known in the field as over dispersion. So even if a cell fires in the same location, you have all that variability noise. I don't know how to call it, right? That adds, that is, 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 somehow representing something that we don't completely understand. There are some labs that have suggested that that over dispersion may be a reflection of the attention that the animal is paying to different inputs in the environment. So maybe on one pass, the animal is looking at a particular cue. On another pass, maybe paying more attention to the smell of its trail or whatever. I don't know, is that incorporated in your model somehow? What do you think about that? I am really intrigued about that, that phenomenon. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm intrigued too. And um, so the labs were, you know, uh, Andrea Fenton has been like, obviously um, the, the guy who um, studied most this, this phenomenon. Um, and yes, you suggested this might be um, evidence of other variables that are encoded. For example, you know, cognitive variables, attention, other other things. What we were talking before, right? You know, place cells are not supposed to just represent space. They're supposed to make a, at least theoretically, a cognitive map that then has other information on it too. So, if you're just looking at space, then you would expect to see that variability. Now, the question is that variability. Um, just noise, it be phenomenal, is it purposeful, is it, you know, all that. And so um, I'm very open to the idea that that's um, variability that comes from representing other uncontrolled or, or not understood variables. In my model, um, you know, there is, I, even if I haven't really matched or quantified and see if the distributions are the same, um, I see that. Um, I see that even in, in this model of generating place fields just from phenomenological uh, grid inputs that follow these Poisson statistics, then the place cell, um, they can be, they can have over dispersion. There can be an excess of variance relative to the Poisson statistics. And that comes from, well, the very reason that some of the cells drift and remap, it's just very similar. So it's just like, um, 
a milder version of that, right? Instead of remapping completely, they just have some of these fluctuations in firing rate, uh, similar to what I show in that slide with the temporal evolution of the trace of activity within the field and the occupancy of the animal. So, uh, so again, you know, it, you know, my model is extremely simple. It's just is how much can you explain just starting from this very uh, subset of what is you know the reality and um, and so I don't you know and you know I don't want to sound like I'm hurling Occam's razors everywhere against every phenomenon <laughs> of the place cells, but you know it's still fun to see. It's like can you even reproduce some of that just based on? Not even putting anything else there, and no, you but know, it's but I, this to an extent. It's fascinating that even in your simple model, you see the phenomenon of over dispersion, because you know it seems that it can be something intrinsic of you yes. know, uh, of the cells. So now, uh, one question though related to that is: is there over dispersion in grid cells? And um, uh, you know, I like to believe I'm an expert in grid cells, and now you know I'm gonna I'll go out on a limb, but I do not remember uh, like a systematic analysis of that from the literature. I might be miss, I might be not remembering, or maybe I missed the doubt. But and and in a way, I myself sometimes I told myself, how come that I never spend the time to analyzing these in grid cells? And you know, one of the reasons is that okay, you know, you gotta have the best data ever because you know obviously you don't want to you know, and and, and uh, but you know in in a lot of you know say my data set there are cells that uh, you know I could definitely investigate that but for some reason or another such a simple question but I haven't I haven't done it. I do remember an early computational model paper by uh, the group Ilafit or her group and they were mentioning that grid cells are, uh, there is actually the opposite of over dispersion. There is, there is um, very regular fighting, even more regular than you would expect from Poisson. But it was really in passing. It was, a, and, and I might even misquoting it, but that's how I remember. That's the only thing I remember at the moment, and I might be misremembering. So, uh, but, you know, because the, the idea is that if there is already over dispersion in, grid cells, then, you know, at that point, you can expect perhaps to have it also in place cells, but. I can kind of zoom way out, can I? Because we've really, we've really drilled down into over dispersion. And I was thinking about maybe a sort of larger question, but this word cognitive map, which gets used a lot, and I'm, I'm really thinking about what, what it means. So I, I remember Tolman, I mean, I, I wasn't there, but I read it and I remember what, what Tolman found and what he found was that rats could somehow um, sort of imagine themselves walking through the maze at, into, into a place that they weren't walking. They would use the map to plan their movements. And, and in fact, it was the fact that they could plan their movements and find a solution to a problem in which their normal route had been blocked that made him think that the rat somehow had a map and could look up alternative routes. So, and that's exactly what I use a map for. I mean, it's not maybe a cognitive map. I was imagining just an actual map and I don't use it to find out where I am. I use it to find out where I should go. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm wondering is, uh, how does a rat use the place cell, the collection of place cells as a cognitive map? Yeah, so um, well, the answer to the very last question is that um, we really don't know. I mean, that is that is very much the the, the, the state of the field is that um, trying to link place cell uh, activity behavior. A lot of people have done it. I mean, Isabel too here and. Um, there is a lot of lead interesting hints, but I don't think this, from my view, it doesn't sum up to a coherent, conclusive, not even close to that story, because there is also 
a lot of cases in which you know seems the behavior doesn't seem to be independent of the reorientation of places some other times instead you know it is it is coherent in early or key studies there is obviously there there, there is clear evidence but uh, there is a lot of theory about how you can you know what's it called um vector based navigation and planning for example from grid cells uh but i mean at least from my perspective the answer is that um we really don't know my naive yeah. expectation would be that while the rat is standing there figuring out what to do you'd see the place cells firing in some kind of sequence and then after that you'd see the rat walk to those places the place cells wouldn't fire when the rat walked to that place the place cells would be firing when the rat was planning to walk to that place well there are different brain states right so actually i'm happy that you brought up that because yeah i should have talked about that too so these um um you know called replay or pre-play of sequences in space by place cells replaying or pre-playing you know and and there is all that literature um and but there are two different brain states right so in the most of when we talk about like the place cell uh, as we know them is during theta state so the animal is moving around and there is theta which is the prominent oscillations in the log of field potential that are correlated with that kind of behavior and and self and place cell fires in a in a in a in a special manner so they fire and they encode you know you can reconstruct the position of the animal as it moves around thanks you know based on how cell fire right um but then when the rat stops and the brain enters these other states for example um you know sharp waves and ripples and it's non-theta and uh, then places, for the most part, with some counter examples coming from, I think from Lauren Frank lab recently, but you know, just as a first approximation, place cells do not uh, do not encode, say, the position anymore, but mostly engage into these um, replay and temporally compressed reactivation of either past experience or potentially planning to go into work. And so the lab, for example, by David Foster and uh, Pfeiffer that was in, uh, in, in, in David Foster lab, now he has his own lab uh, in Dallas, you know, they studied a lot of those things. So that could be very much actually a mechanism and uh, uh, potentially. Um, you know, in terms of big picture, I mean, I'm not really sure, I don't know that I completely agree, or maybe I misunderstood you, but that you only use a map to know where you go, you know, you also use a map, you know, you can use a map also to figure out where you are, you know, it's like, so the map could be, uh, you know, used in that sense too, I suppose. Like if you need to recognize, oh, I'm here where, you know, uh, Maybe you've done a fear conditioning, so it's like the spot where you had a negative experience. It's useful to know where you are because oh, I'm here where that bad thing happened, and you know I probably don't want to be here. So you know, but um, in terms of the origin of the term, I'm happy you brought up Tolman because I really think that's a that's a great uh, you know paper, and most people think it's about cognitive maps, which is true. It's about cognitive maps. Because it's in the title and it's the main argument, but that paper is not really about cognitive maps. That paper is one of the most formidable rebuttal to, uh, let's just say, how to say this diplomatically, um, it, you know, the most extreme interpretation of Skinner's behaviorist school that everything you want to understand about the nervous system is about this idea that everything is stimulus association linking it associating a reward and all of that and you know the the the, the skinner's behavior school really gave an enormous contribution to uh, psychology and neuroscience but i think it is universe you know it is recognized that not all not all learning uh follows that 
that framework. And so when he came out, like, and, and, they, and they basically tried to say, okay, all learning happens that way. Uh, there were a lot of people that fought back. And, uh, you know, you had the, the School of Ethology in Europe, you know, Conrad Lorenz and, and all of them, you know, just saying, there's a lot of learning that doesn't follow that framework. That is the cognitive, the cognitive science almost in a way emerged as a reaction to that, um, you know, Noam Chomsky and uh, more recently, right? You know, Gallistel. So Gallistel used the word cognitive mapping as a slightly different way than say O'Keefe and Nadell did and, and, then, um, and then Tolman. But the cognitive map there was one of the arguments by which he pushed back. And it, it's a really entertaining paper to read because he kind of makes fun of, he takes stabs at you know, this other school and he called them the telephone switchboard school of the nervous system and, and so on. And so everybody should read that paper. But the cognitive map was one of the argument and saying- um, It was also a phenomenon. It was also uh -huh. a, an experimental observation. Yes. It's true that it had all those social implications for scientists fighting with each other, but it was also an experimental finding, right? So yeah. he, an um, uh, animal learned his way around in, a, in an environment without being rewarded. And so in some sense, shouldn't have learned anything in the behaviorist view. And then uh, later was expected to find its way to a goal. And, and then, uh, and it would find its way without trial and error because it somehow had established the layout sure. of that landscape. Exactly. So, so that was his, his argument. Was thinking, if we think that by discovering place fields in the hippocampus that we've discovered the cognitive map, then we should be able to reproduce that experiment and see the, the process by which the rat is solving the problem of how to get to that goal. Can, I, eyes. can I add something? Perhaps I think that the, those experiments, the, the experiment by Dolman was amazing at the time, and he had the major fight with Hal, who was at Yale. So it was Berkeley versus Hull versus Yale. But I think that's something we are putting too much pressure on place cells. And I think that the this the cognitive map he was talking about was not just about the hippocampus, but it was all the circuits that provide this spatial information. And we have grid cells, border cells. Now Hasselmo has discovered the uh, the boundary uh, vector cells, egocentric boundary vector cells. So is all these cell types, the head direction cells, that in combination, I think, give the animal a sense of where the animal is in relation to all the landmarks and boundaries that surround the, the animal. And perhaps all the brain areas involved and all these circuits are necessary to provide this ID, this cognitive map. So it's a very complex concept and we still don't completely can say, okay, here is the cognitive map. If we reactivate these cells, we can reactivate where the animal is because it requires the integrity of so many brain regions and so many connections that have to uh, work together to give the animal a complete sense of where the animal is in relation to everything else. And on top of everything, the recollection of how to get to that goal location, it's a very complex problem because it's not only realizing I am here and these are all the landmarks and boundaries I have, but also I have to remember which is the shortest path that leads me to the reward, which is exactly what Tolman did. Tolman put in the test situation, the rat with several, many, many paths that only one was a shortcut to the goal location and the rat was able to get there without making errors. So I think that we have to take into account so many different regions and maybe I will defend the place cells here. They cannot provide by themselves all the information that the animal needs. I don't know if-, if So we're walking, uh, we're walking this back a little bit, the idea that the place cells are the cognitive map. They're just I, a tiny 
chunk I think it's a and part of it. But maybe Francesco, I mean, I don't know if you disagree with my view. I mean, maybe different people have no, I, I agree with you, you in the sense that, uh, I mean, when they, it was called cognitive map also, because this idea also that you would um, encode other information, not just spatial information, or at least that's how I understand it. But um, also, um, but you make a good point, you know, back then, you know, place cells where what you knew, now you know all these other cells. So perhaps it's these other cells that uh, perform that task. But I still want to give, I mean, I still think Charlie is right to ask that the very original idea that justifies this definition, you know, we should put it to test. You know, we can always put it to test on grid cells. It doesn't have to be place cells necessarily. And just trying to figure out whether that has a sense. And I would say this, I mean, what I think what Charlie was referring to is it's like, okay, an argument about this idea that you don't have just stimulus association, because what, what it basically showed that the rat can take a novel shortcut in space to get to the goal. And so that's something that he hadn't experienced before. So it cannot be something that has been learned through direct experience. And so that's the idea of coming to this comprehensive map that is allocentric. So now you have a representation of space that is not about what you see, but about your location with respect to the external world. And so that's the idea of the cognitive map. And uh, there is no reason why, you know, we shouldn't test it maybe in other cells. Now, I do remember that there are studies um, that try to relate place cells um, with the shortcuts, novel shortcuts, is at least two. Um, and unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say that I don't remember exactly um, what, the, what the group was. And there was, um, and there was a discrepancy. I mean, I think I remember one study showed that there is a correlation. The other side says, you know, place cell fighting does not predict these shortcuts. So kind of going against this idea. Uh, I mean, unless to the extent that you want to probe the concept of cognitive map with that particular paradigm some of the data were against that. Um, so, um, you know, the closest I personally came to kind of tangentially touch on that topic was, you know, my, my favorite in, in 2007, where I showed that some grid cells can anchor to the uh, room reference frame, even as you rotate the box, instead of following this box, it's like the box become like a view on this grid that is like, stays attached to the room and you bring in different fields and um and my in my view that's okay this is able to represent space beyond what you just immediately experience on the platform and i actually brought up tolman in the discussion it's like you know this is the closest to say the comprehensive map but you know going from there to the idea that you uh you know, then grid cells can help you do uh, plan a shortcut, a novel shortcut through a territory that you haven't seen or you haven't really dwelled on. Um, well, we don't know. That's just, there was just speculation in the discussion of that paper, basically, saying it seems like we're inching closer, but it's still, the jury's still out on that. So, um, yeah. It seems like there are two, uh, so at least two sets of problems, right? There's the there's taking all these different types of cells, the boundary uh, vector, the head direction, all these different types of things, and then trying to imp trying to figure out how to solve a cognitive problem with these parts. But then there's also this other part, which seems like especially listening to Hasselmo and also listening to you today, it sounds like these are not categorical. Like these are they're overlapping groups of cells, right? The boundary cell, like you, you showed, I think, maybe I, maybe I miss it, but you showed a, a place cell that was actually um, a boundary cell that, you know, when you, when you expanded the, the space that the animal was in, right? I think, you, but in, in any oh, case, no, there I are mean... a number of different categories that sort of overlap. And then, so in terms of your model, because you model very specifically what, how, what it, what the features are that build these place cells, how do you get, uh, what, what's the next step with these models in building that flexibility? If indeed it sounded like you maybe, it's not as flexible or, or continuous as I think, is that what you were saying? 
Because if, if that premise well, is wrong, I, I, I want to maybe clarify what I showed, but maybe I wasn't clear enough. I wasn't saying that they overlap. I mean, we have absolutely no evidence for saying that a border cell can turn into a grid cell or vice versa. As a matter of fact, I don't really would believe that's not the case. They're really distinct. What I was saying is that if you look at the firing rate map of a boundary cell or a grid cell in an environment that is too small, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. You're not going to be able to say whether that's a boundary cell or a grid cell, because maybe it's just going to fire. It's going to look like a small place field there by a boundary, and you just you can't say which one is which. And you have to really do these experiments in an environment that is large enough so that you get enough room for the cell to express its peculiar spatial representation so you can tell which category it is. I was not trying to suggest that the two categories overlap, just that you can't tell the difference if you are in a small environment. But um, in terms of what you were saying, uh, sorry, I mean, I think I lost the, lost the thread, so but, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, it's just a question of getting back to the models and how do you, uh, so there's, a, there's modeling the cognitive phenomenon, the, the problem this, that these things are supposed to provide a solution for. And then there's actually modeling how these, these cells are built without understanding all the mysterious parameters of what determine, you know, the field of view issue with your boundary cells. Where do you, so your model is really simple and lovely and works what do you do with it now like how do you adapt it how do you add more inputs into it that make it you know flip with uh for reorientation with a you know with a landmark or you know like what where where does one take a really pretty model that works really well in in, in this kind of system that's like explosively full of dimensions um well yeah i mean my model is very simple uh I might even say simplistic. Um, and, uh, um, you know, at this stage, I always use this as a, for, for me, is, I mean, we can, we can talk about all the, how you're supposed to use models and what is the correct method and predictions, non-predictions and all of that. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, for me, it's more like a way of thinking. So whenever I'm thinking about how this, cells interact or anything because you know I I programmed all my life that's almost like a way for me to think and um, and and go deeper on whatever model I have in my mind so at the moment you know if you want to go beyond of course you need to uh, start adding more inputs but also start adding more of the intrinsic connectivity of the hippocampus also had to bring it, you know, at the moment is a single compartment model, but cells are not single compartments. So what I'm modeling probably is a debridic cluster rather than, you know, the, the old cell. So there is that direction toward realistic things, adding more complexity to the cell and more, and more complexity to the network. Uh, but for now, I think it's still very useful to try to explore um, some of these properties about remapping, drifting, and how behavior really impacts this process of generation of uh, place fields, for example. Um, you, know, um, you know, I could think about phenomena, right, where people say like, you know, misplaced cell, you move an object and you have an animal going to where the object was. And now there is a place field there. Is the place field signaling that the object is not there? Or is the place field created there because there is a behavioral tendency to the animal to go where the object is now missing and spend a lot of time there and giving more chance for a place field to form, for example. And it goes both ways in uh, and or like you know people have looked at you know reward cells it's kind of similar like if you spend a lot of time on a reward location maybe you're more likely to make place field and i'm not saying that that's all that there is to it all i'm saying is that it goes both ways and you're able more to appreciate it when you start running this model because you see things that you weren't thinking about and you weren't expecting 
and now you start thinking like almost the opposite and that's where the utility of you know for me the way i use models basically so we're out of time because yeah. it's almost four o'clock um thank you for joining us francesco uh sorry to cut you off so abruptly and we yeah. are neuroscientist talk shop interview, so yes <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks guys for joining us and sorry it went so yeah. late Thank All you right. so much. Bye. And thanks Bye. a lot for this was fun, for the opportunity. Thanks.